You're listening to part two of a Dear Applicants podcast episode. Check out last week's episode to listen to part one of this interview. And how did you find university? I really liked it. It was... I have such fond memories. You spent a significant amount of time at Radcliffe, right? You did a master's there as well. Yes, yes. Um, and of course, met your husband. Yes, I met my husband and all that. I really... I, I was a bit frazzled by the admissions journey, to be honest, because... Maybe when you're in high school, it's quite clear, like, do this, mm-hmm. you'll get an A, especially in the U.S., I would say. And then when you come to school, it's really, like, introspective. And especially my family was so supportive, like, do whatever you'd like to do. We support you. We have your back. There was no, like, intense pressure to pursue one field, another field, or one university over another. Um, and then when I started at Rutgers, it just, it was just such a nice place to be. There's just so many options. It is a big school, so you can kind of have like a a huge lecture where you can, you go to lecture, you know, you take your notes, but you don't really mm. ever interact with the professor directly. Yeah. But then in other departments, it's much smaller. So you do have more seminar style classes as well. So I think it, off- I think it offers a good balance. And Obama came to our university in 2016 and he said, America converges here. And I in think, Rutgers. yeah, at Rutgers, like it's a very, like a crossroads for many places. So, How so I think in his mind and maybe also in my mind, as I like quote it happily, it's that there's just people from everywhere. Like within New Jersey, there's a lot of us mm-hmm. from around the world, from around the United States. And I think that almost everyone I met at Rutgers was a really like genuine, authentic person, like a very like work hard, play hard kind of disposition where people are really willing to, like they'll go to university, I'm sorry, they'll go to class, they'll study, they'll be in the library late and then they'll be like, right now, let's go partake in something amusing. Amusing. (laughs) Amusing, whatever that (laughs) definition may be. And so so pre-partaking in something amusing, what were you studying when you were at Rutgers? So I was studying French and this was kind of the path that I had set for myself because there is a lack of French teachers. There's always, almost every school now is in New Jersey is looking for a French teacher to strengthen their department because it's not so common. And again, like I felt- Spanish. Yeah, Spanish has a lot. That's what I I, I, I studied Spanish in high school in in India, right? So great. Porque todo un poco de español. We, we've done this before with a previous guest and- It's old. It's such bad Spanish. The bit is old. Yeah. All right, no worries. (laughs) But do you speak Spanish? Un poco, un oh, poquito. Un poco. From your multicultural experiences, I guess. In New Jersey, it's oh, it's common. Okay. I would say it's one of the. Can most, you have conversations with people? In Spanish, like very or? limited conversations, okay. like maybe about simple things, like. Okay. So. I'm yes. not testing you. <laughs> I know. I'm like Don't trying to think if there's it. anything I can be like. It's okay. It's okay. You were oh. telling me about French. You can keep going. <laughs> Um, yes, so that was my goal. That was what I wanted to be. And I felt like it was a good way to mix again something I am passionate about, something that I think I could teach well and mm-hmm. uh, not not be the type of teacher that rolls up and is kind of like dragging her feet to work and like kind of being a middling influence on her students, but someone who could really uh, do good work in that space. So that was what I originally pursued. And of course, in that's a... In the university in the U.S., it's 120 credits usually for your degree. So 30 credits will come from your major. Mm -hmm. The other 90 are up to you. 60 are so-called liberal arts. So you have your math, you have your science. Um, And I think because of the flexibility and the openness of the U.S. system, I was also able to complete a degree in medieval studies, which I say is not like what people, which is like classics, but just Uh, a thousand years later. So... So like Canterbury Tales. Yeah, all that good stuff, all that. And I was interested in linguistics, but not in like theoretical uh, Chomsky and linguistics, but more in the applied like historical linguistics sense. So like how did language evolve? How did it come to be? How do we define a language? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. And medieval studies just kind of ticked a lot of those boxes. So there were things like like Old English, like Old French, even uh, a class on Dante, all that good stuff. So I had begun taking those classes to fulfill some core requirements, those so-called 60 credits of liberal arts, and then it just naturally worked out that, because they have no qualms about double counting, right? If your history class so happens to be a medieval history class, that's okay. So that's how 
I ended up there. And you and could again, Ch- Chinese class as well, didn't you? Yeah. So that was another, that's where I met my husband. And this was a Chinese linguistics class. So when I touched down in Singapore, I had some passing knowledge about what it meant to speak Hokkien or Teochew or Cantonese. And I guess that's another space where I appreciate, like, I have some maybe theoretical background, but it's more on the applied side that I get to see it live and breathe every day in Singapore. And how has that shift been? Have you enjoyed it? From moving from the U.S. to Singapore, I have, like, very few complaints, if any. I mean, you were working way before you came to Singapore, right? You were working alongside your your undergrad degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for a significant amount of time as well, right? But most people also work while they're studying. Not like we have office jobs, but people have random... I had a friend, like, she was always at the pool lifeguarding, and she was, like, an art history major and medieval studies as well. So (laughs) that's why. And what were you working as? What were you doing? So I had... I had like the regular campus tutoring, so I was doing that for a while. And then I was also um, coordinating language programs Mm -hmm. in the community. So that required sourcing volunteers. It required then making sure these volunteers could kind of attend and facilitate these conversation programs. And there were a few, it was called Conversation Tree. So there were a few branches. So there was an English branch, but there also was a Spanish branch, which is where all of my Spanish knowledge comes from. And there was also a Mandarin branch. So what was important to us, and especially the director of the program, was that it's never a one-way exchange. A volunteer should never leave the space and feel like chuck this chips that they provided English instruction because mm-hmm. the English facilitator also, you know, should venture out and learn Spanish and have that empathetic experience. So, so that was the best. I loved it so much. Um, Any takeaways from it? Like in life or in, it was just such a good, I think that's why I really loved my university so much. Mm -hmm. It's because I was like, I, you know, the phrase like town and gown, where you're just like in your little ivory tower with your book and you go to the library and you like lug all your books back to your dorm, but you never, you never see how your studies can be applied. I feel like doing that really got me like so connected to New Brunswick and the larger Rutgers space. And did that in any way impact your decision to do your master's? Or? For sure, okay. for sure. Because with, I'd say again, the master's in teaching, it's a nice to have, but not a must have. Mm-hmm. So it was something that I could juggle while working because these classes were also all at night. They were usually in the late afternoons and evenings after school had closed. And... Again, it's like a practicality thing where if I had started in my last year, in my fourth year, you can actually save a bit on tuition. So you only pay one year of grad tuition, even though it's a two years program. So, and again, there, like I just met like, again, strong communities of women were like ever prevalent in my life. And I feel like that's why I was able to get to where I am ultimately today, where we were just so, it was just such a family. We were all the language ed group. So there were a lot of different language teachers, but also English language learner teachers who would like to, people who would like to teach English language learners, all the different kind of like language oriented people. And again, it's more applied linguistics. How do I teach you how to conjugate this verb in an interesting way that you're going to remember and apply when you visit a Francophone country? And also, again, satisfying my practical brain where being a teacher is a good role. You're going to Always have your bread bowl filled, you know? Okay. So, yeah. Before we continue, I would like to take a quick break to remind you to subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps us improve and to reach a wider audience to provide further insight into this arduous journey. Also, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to email us at our email linked in the description below. We'd love to hear from you. And so, well, obviously, now you're in Singapore. How was that cultural shift? Or I guess, were you used to it already, having spoken to your husband for so long? Mm -hmm. Were you prepped? Prepped, I think. You'd already had laksa. I was ready. I knew what to order. I knew that when I get my my fish soup, I need to ask her to add a bit of milk. milk. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it wasn't as big of a shock as people might think. Maybe they look at the flight distance and they're like, oh my goodness, like that's very long. But 
overall, I feel Singapore is a really cosmopolitan city. I, I had read like top 10 things to know before you move to Singapore, which I think every person has Googled right. before they move anywhere. <laughs> and it's like Singapore is safe. The public transport is clean. And I'm from New Jersey, so I'm like, yeah, right. Like, sure it is. <laughs> like, whatever you want to say. And then I got here and it actually is super safe. Not that I ever felt unsafe, like super unsafe in New Jersey, but I just behave a bit differently. Like when I'm on public transport, when I'm out past 9.30 at night, there's just different approaches I would take versus here. Those protocols are like all turned off. I'm just... I mean, you've settled in really well, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's so easy to settle in. I mean, multiple people me. have asked if you just grew up here. Really? They're very confused when we say that. No, no, she actually moved over. Really? I didn't. No, I might um, be the code switching. Maybe. <laughs> need to I need to be in like the right environment. <laughs> it needs Fair to enough. be. That's the thing also. I noticed that I do it now. I didn't notice it until I joined on at Ivy Prep and then I will now see myself doing it where I'm like, oh, like that, Lord. And then they're like, oh, I mean, oh, yeah, it okay, is. Like, very well welcomed. Really? I mean, we love it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, translanguaging, right? That's why. And how do you find Ivy Prep? Why move on from the traditional teaching role that you had uh, into teaching and, I mean, basically running the show for SAT English? Mm. I would say especially what drew me to the role at Ivy Prep is that you're serving a different, a student at a different point in their life. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not on the consulting or the CA side, it is a very, what for me was like kind of a confusing and frazzling juncture, as I said earlier. So it is nice to be with that student population again, that I can almost see myself in a lot of them, even if they're pursuing different things or pursuing different targets in their playing field. It's, it's so open and it can feel so insurmountable. So I think coming into this role, it is also allowing me a lot of like introspection and a lot of like, oh, I remember like this pressure that this this person had or the lack of pressure that the other person had. It's kind of playing out in cycles again. So, but so far, so good. I like teaching the SAT and it's it's more interesting than, than you think, I would say, because I think it does teach a lot of, especially now since the, the revamp, it teaches a lot of applied skills that will serve anyone in any field, whatever they pursue. I did want to ask, what's your experience been like with the whole new format? Ah, uh, with the digital SAT? Yeah, with the digital SAT. So, so far, I would say actually the hurdle or obstacle for students is the fact that it's on the computer. And they're wondering, like, do I get a piece of paper to still write things down? You do. Um, and I think that now, when I look at past SATs, right, even when I was taking the SAT, it was a very select group select group of like great books that you mm -hmm. had to know you had to have read Jane Austen you had to have read several books from a very limited list of people and if you and you had to have a certain knowledge about American history which I think again put the SAT into this really narrow definition of what it meant to be successful to be successful on the SAT the definition was quite narrow now when I look at the questions I feel it is more open and they include a far greater array of things that a greater array of sources, a greater array of authors, a greater array of voices that were previously excluded. So I think it's moving in the right direction. Of course, nothing, you know, no standardized test is ever what someone walks away feeling like, yep, yeah. they got me. They know exactly yeah. what they need to know about me as a person. But, but I think it's moving in the right direction. And I think that if students need it to kind of make up or compensate for a part of their application that they feel is lacking, it can be a good solution for them to short study for and then have a strong academic mark there as well. Got it. I mean, the SAT, I think in recent years, it's a lot of universities now say they're optional. Yeah. The University of California schools don't even look at them. And so a lot of students are wondering whether they should bother or not. The SAT does serve a purpose now. And I would say, again, they are moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good if students still take the opportunity to complete it because, again, it is a reflection of your academic ability outside of maybe your school, your grades, and your performance. You are the one who's responsible for that score, right? Where you might say, oh, well, I didn't, I wasn't thrilled with my teacher in grade 10, so that's why I didn't have a great 
grade in that course where the SAT, you're the sole person responsible. And it also teaches you a good amount of soft skills because even now people are happy to learn that there's a lot of science and social science that's incorporated into these reading passages. So even if you're not a humanities whiz, even if you don't want to be a poet, there's still a good amount of skills you can learn from taking the test and then apply it to your field in STEM or in economics or psychology or whatever you're interested in. Okay. And I guess, you know, a lot of students nowadays, especially in Singapore, tend to have a lot of that, a lot on their plate, right? Mm -hmm. Academically and also outside of academics in terms of the extracurriculars. The SAT is just another thing that you're piling yeah. on top of them. And so do you have any tips, tricks, or just any advice for students mm -hmm. that are thinking, or who are currently approaching the SAT or thinking of doing that? I think the biggest advice or tip you can give your mm -hmm. kind of pro tip or whatever you'd like to call it is that you, you're not alone in pursuing the SAT. Many students are also juggling several things at the same time. Well, so simultaneously, they're preparing for APs, they're taking, they're preparing for their SAT. That's also kind of a good way to prep for college because in college, you can't keep postponing your professor's exam at your own discretion, right? You do have to learn Just how juggling to, yeah, to juggle. So that's a good skill that the SAT will teach you. Another tip, though, I would say is that you can start early and know that really you have support and that you have people to guide you through it. And maybe my other tip is don't, I actually feel when students kind of flounder the most on the SAT, it's actually because they're stressed. Because mm. again, if you're the teacher, the teacher set the exam, then you just kind of, they say jump, you ask how high, but the SAT, it's all on you. So entering the test with the best headspace possible is gonna benefit you the most. Okay. I'd say that's my non-curricula related tip. And on that, I guess, lovely little piece of advice on that parting note, I think we will we'll sort of draw a close to mm -hmm. this here conversation. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much for, for walking us through your life yes, no and problem. talking to us about everything from growing up in Tom's River to now working as an SAT teacher here at Ivy Prep. And thank you, students and parents and dear applicants for joining us today. Uh, please like, follow, subscribe, and join us next time as we continue to discuss and give you personal insights to the admissions process in the US and the UK. Thank you. That's all for today's episode of Dear Applicants. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you found the content valuable and insightful. If you'd like to learn more about our guests or the topics we discussed, be sure to check out our show notes for links and further resources.